in prayer um, for the message today. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you for this opportunity to get together and worship you. And I, uh, I just pray for Paul Miller. He's our speaker today. I just pray that uh, your spirit um, would come over him and speak through him to us. And I also pray that your spirit would come upon us so that we might listen clearly. And um, I just pray that you would speak through him and uh, help us to be obedient to your word. I thank you for that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Kids, you can be dismissed. And then while they're working their way, excuse me, working their way out, I'd like to introduce Paul Miller. He is the director of ministry for Timber Bay. It's an outreach for at-risk youth in Minnesota, Iowa, and Wisconsin. He also runs Timber Bay Emerge, which is a program for young adults in Buffalo, Monticello, Elk River area. He has been with Timber Bay for 35 years and he lives in Waverly with his wife, Leanne, and they have two adult children. Please welcome Paul. Hello, good morning. Um, it's, it's great to be here and, and uh, really cool that the men are going to Timber Bay Camp and Retreat Center. You're gonna love it. It's, a, it's an awesome place. It's where I've been doing ministry for over 35 years now. And actually, when I say where, um, I, I don't work at the camp, Timber Bay Camp. Um, the staff at Timber Bay work in the communities, and we use Timber Bay Camp as a tool to build relationships with kids. So, and we do a lot of ministry in the communities. And so, a lot of Timber Bay ministry going on right in um, this area, actually, Monticello, Buffalo, Elk River, and surrounding communities. So, if anybody has any questions about Timber Bay, if you'd like to know more about it, you can talk to me afterwards. And I'd love to share with you what our ministry is all about. Um, yeah, so uh, as I thought about what to talk about today, um, I, um, I think, uh, yeah, my sabbatical journey, that's what I've titled this. I'm, I'm going to dig into scripture with you, but I have a personal story to share first. Um, I thought, as I thought about this today, I thought about a on our central office, on a wall in our central office at Timber Bay, there's a uh, stencil, and it says, Ministry, and to comfort the disturbed and to disturb the comfortable. Um, and I thought that's a great description of ministry. Today, I'm really hoping, and I don't know where, um, you, you know, where you are spiritually, emotionally. I don't know where you're at with the Lord, but what I hope that my sermon will do is the first part, comfort the disturbed. Um, and we'll, um, we'll, like I said, we'll dig into some scripture. But first, my sabbatical story. So the Timber Bay, the ministry I work with for 35 years, is uh, started suggesting or... Um, encouraging us to take sabbaticals. They'd like us to take them every seven years. And as I thought back, I haven't taken one in 35 years. So I thought, well, um, I'll give it a shot. And I went in kind of kicking and screaming a little bit. I, um, it, but but as, I, as I got into it, I thought, oh, I'm kind of looking forward to this. And as I started planning it, I talked to people about what I should do. I talked to a pastor that said he read a book a uh, book of the Bible every day of his sabbatical. I didn't do that. Um, uh, I, I, I talked to other people who suggested that, that I visit other ministries and I volunteer somewhere and I get perspective somewhere else. And so I packed my sabbatical idea. So it was last summer that I, I decided to go June, July, and August. So I'm going to accomplish a ton of stuff on this sabbatical. That was my plan. Um, I, I also went into this sabbatical feeling, uh, feeling fairly tired, and uh, but not putting a lot of thought into that. Um, I uh, the summer came, and as I entered, I had no clue what I was doing. So I, I uh, got some ideas from the navigators, 
who have a manual for sabbaticals. And, and so as I opened it up, it's like a 20-page manual. And um, I, uh, so I had, like I said, I had no idea what I was doing. I talked to a, a friend of mine, a pastor friend of mine, before I went in, and he suggested a book that I, read, that I should read. It's called The Cure. And I eagerly wrote it down, and I was like, I'm going to do a lot of reading. I'm just going to pack my time with reading and doing all these things. And then uh, bought the book and headed into the sabbatical. It was divided into five phases, what the navigator suggested. And so I, um, I went into the first phase of prepare. I had kind of done that. I went into the second phase, which was called rest and recovery. Um, this is a phase where you disengage, where you just stop doing and, and just rest. Um, this was the hardest two or three weeks of my career. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I, uh, I was frustrated during the time. I was angry. I was supposed to be doing fun stuff, you know, projects around the house and reading and just enjoying life, but um, ask my wife and my dog. I was just mean. Um, and, and, and she reminded me of that, actually, in the middle of it. And I, I'm like, what in the world is going on? And I, I read a little deeper, and the navigator said, I, I should expect that, to not do what you've been doing for 35 years. But I also got this feeling that not all was right with my heart and my, my walk with the Lord. Well, I got through that phase, and I entered the next one. Um, and I, uh, this phase was a reflect and focus phase. This was when you take time to ask the Holy Spirit, what, what do you want to tell me? What do you want to teach me? And so, uh, there was, I do this while I'm hiking, a lot of, a lot of hiking, a lot of alone time. And so I grabbed a, um, my Bible, my hiking shoes, and a book that this guy had suggested to me, The Cure, and I, I went off on a hike. I, um, I got done with the hike, and I sat down for some prayer time, and, um, and then I started to read this book. And I won't get into the book too much, but early on, a question is posed. It's this, am I living my life to please God, or am I living my life trusting God? And that didn't seem fair to me. I, I want to do both, right? I want, I want to trust God, but he's done so much for me, I want to please God. And so I found myself getting interested in this fictional story of a person in this book choosing between the two options. He's got to choose one or the other. As he works hard, he chooses pleasing God, and as he works hard to please God, uh, he finds himself never measuring up. He fails often, and he's very discouraged by his failures. When he decides to come back and take the trusting path, he finds himself in a place of grace and mercy. I came to a question posed in the book that hit home for me. As I was sitting there, do I measure my closeness to God by how little I'm sinning? Or do I believe I'm close to God because I trust that to the extent the Father loves Jesus, Jesus loves me. And I began to realize, as I thought of my life in ministry, that I'm living my life to please God. And at the end of most days, I feel like he's displeased with me. I grew up on a farm in central Iowa. And my dad when he would leave for the day sometimes and leave me with a list of stuff to do. And a lot of times when he got back, I didn't accomplish nearly as much as what he thought I should. And I just remember that, you know, my dad like, oh, this is it? That's all you did? That's the picture I had of Jesus. At the end of the day, it's like, come on, Paul, this is all you got? And I was tired, frustrated, and feeling far from God. If I had a good day where great ministry happened, I felt like he was pleased with me. If I had a, a bad day, and, and again, it's easy to feel close to God, isn't it, during those times when things are going great and you're, you're just humming along? If I had a bad day and things didn't go well, uh, then he was far away. 
displeased. And I'd go to bed with the thought, uh, tomorrow I'm going to try harder. So at the end of one of these chapters, I'm sitting there reading, okay, and at the end of the, one of the chapters that I was reading this book, the, it actually said, lace up your shoes and go on a hike and ponder <laughs> what you've just been thinking about. And so I went on the same hike again. Now, all through this, going into the sabbatical, I had read a verse in, in Acts. It was, it was Peter's second sermon as, um, after Pentecost, and, and he actually says, repent so that God's presence will come and times of refreshing will come. And I thought of that. And I'm like, oh, that's a great prayer. You know, that's just a great verse for a sabbatical. I want refreshing. I need times of refreshing. And, and in that, I had been praying for God's presence so that I could get times of refreshing. Um, I go on this hike, and I'm, again, I'm walking, and I'm praying for God's presence. And I stopped at one point, and I'm like, what am I doing? He's here. He's in me. And I just I stopped, and I wept. And this huge cloud lifted. Now, the fact that I cried is not a big deal. I tear up at the Hallmark commercials. I mean, I'm just like, I'm one of those... I just cry. I mean, it's easy for me to cry. Um, it's, but, but at that moment, this weight just lifted off. I'm in his presence right now. Um, this is difficult for me to share, and I've shared it with a lot of people. I've been a follower of Jesus for 50 years. I've been in ministry 35 in Timber Bay, and I was a youth pastor in a church before that. And I, I struggle with the fact that I didn't get this basic thing, this basic truth about God's presence and who I am in Christ. So maybe I'm the only one this morning facing this dilemma. And if that's the case, smile politely, write down some notes to make me feel good, and uh, we'll get on with our day. But if you're a follower of Jesus and you're struggling with shame, feeling far away from the Lord, let's dig into Scripture together this morning and be refreshed again with who God is and who we are in Christ. Um, so, by the way, at this point in my sabbatical, my plans changed. Um, I dropped all the to-do stuff. I saw that even my sabbatical was trying to please God, right? It was just trying to be trying to just accomplish stuff and be a super, super Christian ministry guy. Um, so it changed, and what I felt the Holy Spirit telling me to do was just start listening. Spend time with him. Now here's the benefit of a sabbatical. When you're doing ministry day after day, you're reading the Bible to teach it, you might find a wonderful promise, a truth that you're going to share, and there's usually a little time to meditate, very little time to meditate and go, go deeper. In a sabbatical, um, you wake up the next morning and you listen again. And it's, it's an awesome um, experience. Like I said, it's, it's difficult, um, but um, so it was a few days later that I was reading um, reading the Bible, and I was actually reading through the Bible, and the spot that I was in, in the Bible, was Romans chapter 7. And um, if you want to turn there with me, um, we'll start um, going into some, some scripture here. Um, at, we'll start at verse 15. Romans 7, verse 15, for I, do not, for I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good now. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing in good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do 
the good I want, but the evil I do not want, is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do what do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am. Can anybody besides me relate to that line? Don't raise your hand if you don't. <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand. You can if you want. Um, this word wretched, you can, see, you can just feel this scripture building up to that point, right? Wretched man that I am. Um, Strong defines that Greek word as troubled, afflicted, miserable, wretched. Wretched absolutely described where I was at. Um, it's, a, it's a great word for that description. And when I read this, the thought came to me, and I believe the thought came from the Holy Spirit, is that, Paul, you've been living in Romans 7, 15 through 24. So, so let's read on. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but with my flesh I serve the law of sin. There shouldn't be a, a, a chapter break here. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. We just stop there and receive God's word. Uh, there's so much more in, in Romans 8. Let's read 8, 8 uh, 31 through 39. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for all, us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Jesus Christ is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword, as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Again, we just, we just need to receive that. You might say, but I did that awful thing again. I, I just feel like God is disgusted with me. No, nothing in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. He is not disgusted with you. But I have doubts. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, our Lord. In my ministry, um, we work with a lot of struggling and um, young people that are, that are dealing with a lot of difficult things. And one young man I remember from years and years ago, um, he, he called me in the middle of the night. Now, he had had a, a very difficult um, upbringing, lived with a dad that was an alcoholic and um, struggled through a lot of abuse and pretty difficult situations. But he had um, come into our Timber Bay program and he had given his life to Jesus at one point. And he called me in the middle of the night and his, uh, his uh, I think his dad had been raving or something and he 
Um, he was out on the street, and I drove and picked him up, and we sat and talked in my car. And at one point, he looked at me and said, I asked Jesus into my life. Is he there? And I'm like, it just feels so far away. It's a question that we all got to wonder at times. Where is God in this? Um, so what, what happened? And, I, and as we sat there, I, we read scripture, and I prayed for him. I en- encouraged him to um, continue to put his faith in Jesus. But um, So it, um, what happened then when you put your faith and your trust in Christ Jesus for salvation and the forgiveness of sins? Um, I want to dig into scripture and just you know, look at we just go through a bunch of them and look at who we are in Christ. And honestly, as I, as I prepared this, I, I felt like a, a mosquito must feel at a water park. <laughs> it's like, where do I start? Um, this is, uh, there's so much there. Um, so let's walk through some of these afresh and let them just flood our hearts with truth today. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Let's turn there. It's so good to hear Bible pages turning <laughs> in our culture. Um, that's awesome. Um, 5.17 says, Therefore, if, any, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is past. Behold, the new has come. It doesn't say that if anyone is in Christ, they are becoming a new creation. It says you are a new creation in Christ. Let's go to uh, Ephesians 1, 7 through 8. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. It doesn't, again, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, not the, not the effort <laughs> that we're putting in lavished upon us. I mean, the word, I love lavished even more than I love the word wretched. Um, lavished, it's like, like I said, I grew up on a, on a farm in central Iowa, and I remember Thanksgiving, and, and my, my, my aunts, um, aunts here, I guess, in Minnesota, but um, bringing way more food than we could ever eat, and just lavishing us with, you know, and so you, you eat until you're full and you keep eating and it hurts <laughs> and because the food's in front of you. He lavished grace upon us. It's a, it's a gift that is overwhelmingly full and, and, and um, able to um, completely and totally save us. Our sins were forgiven. Um, let's go to Romans 3, 23 through 24. If you're like me growing up in a Christian home, you probably already, you probably know these by heart, a lot of them. Romans 3, 23 through 24. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, there's the bad news, and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is Christ Jesus. The good, the good news. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. What a powerful 
verse, when you put your faith in Christ Jesus, you became the righteousness of God. We are not working toward getting the righteousness of God. You are maturing into what he, through the cross, has already made you. Pleasing God is not a bad desire. But if your main desire is, if your main desire, if we are trying, if it is your main desire, if we're trying to get God's approval by our works, then we are living under law and not under grace. Okay, let's say it this way. This comes from the book, again, The Cure. And this was, this was big for me. On your worst day, if you can think of your worst day in the last year, you are the righteousness of Christ. On your worst day, you are justified by your faith. On your worst day, he loves you with a perfect, unconditional, everlasting love. My, a few years, a couple years ago, my daughter, before she got married, was living with us and working with AmeriCorps, and she was about a half hour from our, from our house. She was driving to a, a middle school, and I was working. I work out of my house sometimes, and I, so I was home with a lot of stuff to do. And she called me, and I, I took the call, and, hey, sweetie, what's up? And she, she started to tell me that she was sick. And she's at work, and she didn't feel like she could drive home. And she wondered if I could come and get her, and we could get her car later, but she needed to ride home. And before I thought about it, before I could pull the phone away from my mouth, I went, <sighs> um, and I don't believe her, but she says that the nurse heard it, the sigh. It was so loud. Um, and she reminds me fairly often that I did that. Um, and I did go get her <laughs> and, and brought her home. Isn't it wonderful, though, that you'll never get that from God? You approach God. He will never give you a heavy sigh like it. I'm too busy. I don't have time for this. Oh, he welcomes us with open arms no matter where we're at. It's just an awesome love that can be depended on and that we can walk in. This was kind of the theme verse, Ephesians 2.13, um, that I, for this, just kind of for how I was feeling in this journey. Um, Ephesians 2.13 says this, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. He's not far away. He's near. He's in you. He's holding you, loving you, smiling on you. He delights in being with you. So what do we do with this? Let's give you a, a, a few things to think about application-wise. Number one is reject the lies if you've been believing them. If you're feeling like God is disgusted with you, reject that lie. If you're in Christ. When I shared my sabbatical um, kind of experience with my pastor, and I go to the Buffalo Evangelical Free Church, um, he, uh, he had me pray with him out loud and reject the lies out loud with him just so that I'm, he's making sure that, that I'm um, following through with rejecting um, the lies that I had been living and believing that at the end of the day, God is far from me. Um, so reject those lies. Um, don't, don't believe them and don't walk in them. The second thing I would say is meditate on the scripture that reminds us of our identity in Christ. We've read a bunch today. There's a ton of scripture. Um, and by meditate, I mean just think about them and ponder them and, and hold them close to you. Spend time with them. Let them, let them um, penetrate deeply um, as, you're, as you're reading them. And then the last thing I'd give you... Um, this morning is um, 
spend, take time just to delight in his presence. Um, remember he's with you and, and recognize that he's with you and take time to, in that moment, to just delight in his presence. As he pours out his love to you, pour out your love to him and spend time with him in um, just receiving the love that he has for you. For me, uh, even my prayers can become a to-do list. I've got this list of people I'm praying for, and i got to get through this list. And I, so often my prayer time becomes this time of accomplishing and doing. Um, certainly interceding, it's so important that we do that. But take time to just spend time receiving his love and spending time with him. Um, rest in him as his dearly loved child. Thank you um, so much for um, inviting me to speak today and letting me share my story with you. Um, I'm grateful. Again, if anyone wants a little more information about um, Timber Bay or any other questions you have for me about this journey that I took um, last summer, um, I would love to um, talk with you after the church service. Let's, um, if you could just bow your heads as I close. I'm going to close this with a prayer. And this is a prayer from Ephesians chapter 3, verse 19, or verse 14 to 19. This is a prayer from Paul the Apostle, and I want to pray this for us. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of Of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Amen.